Hey guys, uh, this is, I hope, going to be the very last segment of the first chapter, uh, Geologic Time. Uh, and uh, the last segment, I stopped with the half-life of the radioactive isotopes. And just a couple of words about um, how do the physicists measure the half-life of a particular isotope. Um, usually the in the nuclear physics, people can... Um, give pretty good predictions of the value of the half-life for uh, the radioactive isotopes. However, it's very, very important that they have experimental evidence. Uh, so in the science labs, uh, they use mass spectrometers, um, and the mass spectrometer can create very, very clean samples uh, with no number of uh, isotopes, atoms, isotopes. Uh, so then they put the sample in a controlled environment, externally controlled lab environment, and they leave it there for years, depending on the half-life of the radioactive isotopes. Uh, sometimes even for decades, they can leave it for a long time. So they get enough decay, so they, they are able to, to calculate the number of um, parent isotopes versus the number of the daughter isotopes. Um, in this way, the half-life of many isotopes is known, and, and it's pretty accurate, and all the models are, are uh, confirmed. So we can say that the half-life of these radioactive isotopes are, are pretty sure. Um, additionally, the age of the Earth can also be confirmed using spectroscopy or spectroscopy. It's a hard word for me, Spectras spectroscopy of the supernova, especially if you have shorter half-life. It's really good to use that for. The next slide shows uh, a picture of a mass spectrometer, basically really not the picture of the mass spectrometer itself, but the way it works. So you can see that um, you put the sample here, and then uh, there is an electron beam, uh, electron beam coming in, and that actually ionizes the sample. And as the sample goes through a very strong magnet, it actually will separate into, into the different isotopes, the heaviest and the lightest and so on. You understand that the difference between the isotopes that you have, uh, for example, the uranium, the two, 235 and the 238, the 238 has three more neutrons, so therefore it's heavier. And this very strong magnet actually can make uh, that the heavier and the lighter isotopes separate from each other. So this is how the mass spectrometer works. Actually, I had the, I had the chance to learn more about these things because at Virginia Tech I took a class and even the name is sounding really, really hard. The name of the class was um, uh, Isotope Geochemistry. And in that class, actually, I worked in a mass spectrometer lab. And I can tell you that those labs cleaner than any hospital surgery room because, because um, it is extremely important that we couldn't use the, the same clothes. You had to change clothes. You had to change shoe. Everything was just absolutely um, clean because it was very important that we wouldn't contaminate our samples because these samples are very small and... Uh, the amount of atoms in it cannot change from contamination, so it's extremely important that, that these labs are, are um, super clean. Um, anyhow, that was a hard class, and it was very interesting to learn about the mass spectrometer. I did work myself with isotopes, but mostly with stable isotopes. You know, those are the ones which do not decay. Um, just about every element has isotopes, we talked about that. Okay, after the mass spectrometer, I have a slide here which shows you the, the most commonly used in geologic dating, uh, radioactive isotopes, the parent isotopes, and these are their stable daughter isotope, and this is their half-life. Now, this is quite important that uh, when, when you want to uh, get the absolute age of a sample, and I have probably already mentioned to you that it's going to be mostly igneous rocks. Um, you have to have some kind of idea about the age of that sample because 
because it's very important that you use a type of isotope which is good for for that particular sample like if you have a sample which is about three billion years you have to choose a, a radioactive method which is which is just fine for that and I can tell you right here there is an example carbon-14 carbon-14 uh, has a half-life of 5730 years um, so therefore you cannot use uh, this particular isotope for elements which are for for samples which are much older than than five thousand seven hundred and thirty thousand years um, I'm gonna show you the the half-life curve which is very important to know and after that you will understand exactly why it is important to choose the right isotope to to uh, to calculate the age of your sample this here is the calculation itself actually and that is um, a math equation which you don't have to know. The, the capital D here is the daughter element and the capital P is the, the parent element which you can actually define in the sample and the lab, lambda is the, is the decay constant. Basically um, the decay constant they also use the, the half-life, decay constant and half-life, but for the calculation, the time calculation, they use the decay constant. And this slide shows you the minerals, which are most likely very good for doing uh, geologic age on them. Um, because the uranium and all the radioactive elements usually stay back toward the end of the magnetic crystallization, most likely we will find them in minerals which are mostly phallic, means that they will crystallize at the end of the of the cooling. So these are the most commonly used minerals. Um, uh, like very commonly used method is the potassium 40 for age determination. And so therefore the the most likely source for it is gonna be the K feldspar muscovite amphibole like in granite and if they use the uranium 235 or 238 method those are most commonly enriched in zir zircon which is a accessory mineral in granite usually again the orthoclase might have a lot of okay felts but remember might have a bunch of uranium atom the monoxide is also an accessory mineral along with the appetite and the sphene so these are the most commonly used minerals to to define uh, absolute age on rock samples. And uh, this here is a very important slide and we're gonna do this in the lab so you will understand it more. This is the so-called half-life curve. And I might even ask this on the test. Uh, for, for the distance learning classes, it might not be the, the regular test, but definitely the midterm. So the half-life curve, um, it's very easy to understand really basically what happens you you got a given sample and it doesn't really matter what kind is it main thing that it has a certain radioactive element in it what we use to define the age of that sample so here we have the number of radioactive elements and on this curve we have the half lives and and uh, actually here we do use the um, on this figure it's the carbon-14 so they deep do put down the half-life of the carbon-14 that's 5730 years so they add it up so the second half-life is 11,460 and so on okay so what happens with our original sample at time zero we have all the radioactive carbon-14 present in the sample so it it's 100 percent of the original radioactive elements are present after the first half-life and we're following the blue curve here. After the first half-life, half of the original elements are decaying. So you have one half of the original radioactive atoms left or isotopes. If if you look at the that 50% actually decays into the daughter element, which is in this case for uh, nitrogen 14. So if you look at the brown curve versus the blue curve. The blue curve shows you the radioactive element, the parent isotope, and the brown curve shows the daughter isotope. So as you can see, if your sample is closed, which we assume that it is closed, so nothing has gone in or out, 
therefore the radioactive elements as they decay will stay in the sample as the daughter isotope. So therefore, the number of daughter plus parents are always equal with the original number of radioactive elements here. So the two always will add up to the original 100% radioactive isotope. So after the first half-life, we have half of the original radioactive isotopes present and the other half went into the, uh, the daughter isotope. After two half-life, we have half of the, the half, so we have 25% left, or one half, we should say, and the number of daughter elements went up just exactly by as much as it decayed, so that would be then now the daughter is 75% and the parent is 25%. After the, after the third half-life, I believe, 17,190 in case of carbon-14, we have 12.5% of the original atoms left as parent isotope, and at the same time we have 12.5, so we have 87.5% daughter. So as you can see, as the parent is going down, the daughter is going up two together is always going to give the number of the original atoms. Now, if you for some reason don't understand this, do not worry. We're going to go through this in the lab and definitely you can ask me too. So this is what we call the half-life curve and it's curve and, and it's important that you understand it. So if you don't, you can listen to this again or ask me in the lab. The Next slide shows you the, the sequence of the radioactive decays. Remember when we did the example, the uranium-235 decayed by alpha decay, and we did it together, it went into thorium. But the thorium is another radioactive element. Really, basically, the stable element, these elements all decaying into is lead, which is 82. So as long as you have higher number as as atomic number as than 82, it's always going to be another radioactive element. So therefore, the decay is not stop. It's going to go on, and, and it's either alpha or beta. This slide actually shows you the, uh, the sequence of the uranium-238. Uh, we also call it the decay chain. So as you can see, the, the uranium-238 goes uh, with the alpha particle to thorium-234, and then so on. It's like nine steps before it gets to lat 206, which is the, the stable isotope there. So that is the radioactive decay chain. Okay, whenever we use radioactive age measurement, there is always problem. And if somebody tells you that there is no problem, that that person is lying. There is always errors. And errors can be different kinds. We can have error from... Uh, measurement, we can have uh, contamination, we can have weathering. When you have weathering, that might be that the sample wasn't closed after all, that it could have had um, lead coming in or radioactive element going out. Uh, the other problem which could have been is, is that there was a metamorphism. And remember, what is the metamorphism? Yes, it's high pressure and temperature. And very many times when a mineral has a lower uh, melting temperature and you have a high rate metamorphism, the temperature could get high enough for some of the minerals, such as the k spot. You know, that is almost the last one to precipitate. So therefore, it will melt e really easily. So therefore, if the k spot melts, then your uh, uranium goes in and out. So your radioactive clock restarts, we call it. The clock restarts. But the, the good thing is that you have to understand that when this happens, actually you are making your mistakes toward younger ages because you're really measuring the, the age of the metamorphism instead of the, the age of the original rocks. That's very hard to make a mistake toward older ages. Most of the mistakes which are happening is toward younger ages. Now, this is where I can tell you that another problem is that if somebody is trying to use carbon-14 for ages more than 70,000 years, uh, if, 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 you, if I go back to this uh, just for one second, see how the amount of original isotope is going down 
and if you went one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, seven half life, basically the the amount of parent isotope left in the sample is equal to zero. Now what that means is that you cannot really get the number of the parent isotopes in your sample because everything becomes daughters. So therefore you cannot do an accurate measurement and calculation. So therefore this this isotope can only be used for just certain amount of times, usually 10 times of the half-life or even less because you want to be inside the, the limit of measurement. So the, the carbon-14 cannot be used for more than, more than uh, like 50 to 70,000 years. So if somebody told you that this sample was measured by using carbon-14 and its age is a million years, what do you say? Of course, that it's impossible. You cannot use carbon-14 for a million years. The maximum you can use it for is 70,000. Now, the other thing you always have to look for, if you ever look at a, if you ever, ever look at a radioactive uh, age data, it always has to be like this, 153 plus minus, and it has to go like this, plus minus, let's say, 4 million years. Without the, the error, that means that you're not only making one measurement, you, you always make a whole bunch of them. And you cannot measure the exact same number, so there will be some kind of error. And uh, the both sides, the, the biggest error has to be shown. And if it's more than like 20% of the original number, then the, then the measurement is not very good. So it has to be relatively small. 153 plus minus 4 million years is pretty good. But if you have like 55,000 plus minus 40, that's not a good measurement. So you've got to understand. If you don't understand yet, ask me in the lab. That's good. Okay? Now, the last thing we have to talk about is the, is the fission track. The fission track dating happens because when the uranium actually decays by the alpha decay, the alpha particle is pretty big. So as it comes out of the, the mineral structure, it leaves a track. So what they do, actually, they, they, they etch the surface of the, they make a thin section. That's usually 40 micron thin. And they put it on a glass plate and etch the top of it with hydrogen fluoride, which actually brings up the, the damages caused by the, the decay. And they count the, the number of, the, you know, the number of damages. And then they send the sample into a nuclear reactor and they force decay the leftover radioactive elements. And then they send the sample back and they recount the decays. I mean, they recount the damages. That's how they get the parent and the daughter elements, actually, in this case. So this was our very last slide. And that's what we call fission track dating. And it's it's um, it's relatively good way to do it. Uh, but if there was a high temperature metamorphism, the, the little damages might heal. So I hope you enjoyed this slideshows and um, I will see you guys again.